Awesome. Hello. Welcome. My name is Carl Krantz. I'm a co-founder of SVVR along with uh, Cymatic Bruce Wooden here. So many of you are like family to us. We've been doing this for so long. Um, SVVR really has become like a family. Um, but I know there are many new faces here. So um, I just want to say a few words about how SVVR is a little bit different from other events that you uh, may have experienced. Uh, one is we are VR people first, learning how to throw events. Um, some of the people we work with may uh, kind of curse us under their breath for that. but. Uh, <laughs> But um, we are doing what's right for the VR industry every step along the way. We try not to be gross about things. We try not to, you know, anything that's sponsored is clearly indicated as such. Um, that said, we really, really, really appreciate our sponsors. So thank you all to all the companies that sponsored. Uh, you'll, you'll see their logos up there in a few minutes. Um, and we are different also because we are, um, we bring together all verticals of virtual reality and all cultures, um, especially this year, we're bringing over a lot of new, new folks from overseas. And I think that's really important that we bring everyone together, people doing medical VR, enterprise, gaming, all out of home uses, v-sports, every possible use of VR because they're all learning things and we need to share, we all need to get out of our bubbles, we need to build bridges between these verticals, bridges between communities across the world. I think that's really, really important. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to now hand it off to my partner, Cymatic Bruce Wooden, our VR hero. Take it away, Bruce. <laughs> all right. Sweet. Thank you, Carl. Um, yeah, so fun. Here we go. Uh, so welcome, everyone, to SVVR 2017. Hope everyone enjoyed the donuts and the coffee. It was a beautiful bribe to get you here today, uh, to get you here this morning. Um, so we are so excited to have a really great keynote to kick it off with some uh, really dynamic folks that have been uh, kind of in the VR trenches since this whole resurgence has begun. Um, so we're going to get right into it and start off. Uh, our first is uh, Tony Parisi, um, an overall cool, cool gentleman. I'm going to get his bio up here. Um, so Tony is a, a virtual reality pioneer, uh, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, and an angel investor as well. Uh, he's actually well known for being the co-creator of uh, several 3D graphic standards, including VR, ML, uh, X3D, and GLTF, which uh, actually we're excited about at Altspace VR. Um, that's uh, very awesome. Um, so it's a uh, really just very involved in web VR uh, and also in mobile applications, and uh, we're really excited to kind of have him kick off uh, this day here at SVVR 2017. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tony to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fourth annual SVVR. For many of us, this is where it all started, a small community of meetups um, with these people hanging on to this vision of a technology that didn't uh, you know, promise a lot for the future but didn't quite work that well yet, and uh, all the way through the Oculus Kickstarter and peak hype and to where we are today. So it's uh, really great to be here. It's been a ride. Let's get into it. So I first tried my first DK1 in about 2012. I gutted it out for about, say, 10 minutes, took it off woozily, and said, this thing isn't ready yet. I'm kind of a veteran of the industry, so I was a little battle-hardened, and I thought, you know, maybe uh, it's too big, too bulky, decidedly not cool. Well, uh, like a lot of us, uh, my mind was changed with the watershed of the Facebook acquisition of Oculus. I started to think maybe this stuff is actually going to get real. Even the most wizened and uh, skeptical of us had to really take notice when a communications giant with a lot of resources had ambitious plans for a technology like that. So just a few months later, Carl Krantz contacted me to speak at the first ever SVVR conference. By this point, I decided I was all in. I began to cook up my ideas for my first startups and started advising and investing in companies and stayed on the front lines as this young industry started taking shape. And now here we are, three years later. The crazy bet seems to be paying off. VR is going strong with signs of continued growth, a diversity of users and use cases, and even the glimmer of the first killer apps. We have a thriving ecosystem of hardware, software, tools, big companies and small companies, 
studios and independent creators and enterprises continuing to push the bounds of what this technology can do. We even have career specialists in something called VR and AR strategy, whatever that is. With this background in mind and another exciting conference kicking into gear, I thought it would be good to step back for a few and take a look at where we've come from, where we are, and what we're doing, and then where we can go from here. By the numbers, here's where we are today. Five million Gear VRs, a million PS VRs, hundreds of thousands of the desktop systems in play. Now, that's not uh, billion scale yet, but you can't get to billions until you go through your first few million. So it seems like we're well on the way. We even have some healthy signs economically with Job Stimulator. It grossed three million in Steam last year, some number like that. And VR has been hitting the mainstream consciousness. We're seeing it in TV commercials. You see it during sports events. That's a really good sign. And of course, my favorite VR image of all time. Here's 44, deep in the metaverse. So have we actually hit the mainstream yet? Are we moving from early adoption and enthusiasm to mainstream use? Well, we don't know. Only time's going to tell. I don't have a crystal ball, and I've been wrong so many times before. I wouldn't even hazard a guess. that by uh, reducing the separation between what you're viewing and the experience, we can get a greater sense of empathy. With computers, with TVs, with uh, mobile phones, we're looking at a screen. But when you're inside the screen, you can't help but feel connected. You're inside the experience. You're now not a viewer, you're a witness. You're within. Emblematic group, 
empathetic media, and other dedicated new media journalists are using real-time CG as well to tell documentary stories in VR, stories of war, family conflict, abuse of authority. And these stories make us uncomfortable in a way that seeing these things in a lean-back 2D screen environment simply don't. Construct Studio, with the price of freedom, takes empathy to the next degree. This is a story based on a true story of uh, espionage in the Cold War and mind control experiments. Spoiler alert, it does not end well. And um, you may never look at the world the same again. If you haven't tried this, you need to try this. But this basically makes us more than just a witness. We're actually a participant. We're the protagonist in a story. And the, all these empathy techniques help us understand our world quite a bit better. But if you're like me, you have, your capacity for self-enlightenment only goes so far. Sometimes it's important to just get away. Books, movies, TV, board games, video games, puzzles. We use these communication media to thrill and delight, to tell stories of a brighter future, or sometimes just allow us to get off this rock for an hour or two. Baobab Studios' Asteroids continues the space-bound adventures of mac and cheese. In this version, you're a helper robot helping the heroes through their, uh, various tasks and ultimately you save the day. Asteroids is feature film quality graphics, but you're in the middle of it and it's running in real time on a PC. You're at the center of the action. It just might be the start of interactive VR, VR storytelling for real, and it's a delight. I don't know how many of you have seen Dreams of O from Felix and Paul. It's the best 360 piece I've ever seen. It's based on Cirque du Soleil's breathtaking uh, aquatic show O. For more than 10 minutes, you're taking through a haunted world of water, fire, acrobatics. Your tour guide is this white-faced bishop waving a brazier way too close into your face. I was ter terrified and mesmerized. <clears throat> I lost myself. I had no sense of time, no distance, just pure wonder. So the best VR entertainment creates, this, creates new worlds like this for us to inhabit. And it can bring us out of the mundane even for just a short time. So while you know, VR might be the ultimate empathy machine, I kind of think maybe it's the ultimate escape pod. We could all use some of that right about now. We talk a lot in VR about presence. Um, and some people have executed really well on this idea that we can be present. We can be in an environment and feel like we're really there. But for most of those, I don't know about you, but I've never felt like it was a first person experience. It always feels like a third person experience. So you've got a great sense of place, but you don't necessarily have a great sense of self. And I think a lot of that is because it's extremely hard to represent your body in VR, at this, given the state of the technology right now. So, um, some people have taken a different tack on that. The folks from within created this piece called Life of Us, which doesn't just give you a body, it gives you several bodies. You start out as protozoa, then evolve to fish, then primates, then human, and then even post-human. And it uses uh, positional tracking in the hand controllers to great effect, so that you can flap your arms, wave, and draw streams of light in the sky. But you're on rails, it's a totally fun ride. You don't have to worry how to locomote, it takes you through it. And more than that, it gives you a live companion on the journey. You do this with another person. It's a multiplayer experience. So it takes the guesswork out of locomotion. You're not using the hand controllers and asking, what can I do? How do I work this? And you're actually there with someone else. But, so because of that, you have a sense of self. You actually are seeing yourself through the other person you're taking that thrill ride with. And so that really is the beginning, potentially, of interaction design that makes us feel like not just that we're really there, but we're actually a part of it and we have a self. Now, VR is actually being used to, make, uh, to market and sell products a lot, and it's going to be used a heck of a lot more in the future, along with uh, AR and every other R. It's safe to say that every available inch of virtual real estate is going to be up for sale for manufacturers and marketers to sell their wares. The history of advertising, after all, is the history of a rise in production value. And we have more production value to bring to bear with these kind of technologies than ever before, 3D graphics, animation, immersive audio, haptics, just to name a few. The folks from Rewind Studios in London created this wonderful piece, which is a multi-sensory, multi-user experience where you're uh, in the driver's seat of a racing car, and it takes you on a thrill ride and then shows you um, cool new features of the car. And that's great. You, you, if you, let, you come out of this and you buy the car, they're going to be really happy. But even if you don't, you're going to think a lot more and a lot higher of that brand than you did before. And so their brand value just went way up. All of these interactions in VR also generate more data. Beyond the conscious interactive choices we're making, we can monitor, monitor direct manipulation input, track head and eyes, 
and even analyze sentiment based on subtle movement. There's interesting things happening there. With immersive technology, we're gonna get insights into individuals and collective behavior even more than we did before. We can design better products, sell more of them, and get better customer relationships going. But beyond this for marketing and advertising, engagement's gonna make all the difference in education. The more actively involved we are and the more physically engaged, the more we retain and the better we learn. Here we go. And this can go from everything from education to situational awareness training to operating heavy machinery. These are all going to get a huge bump from immersive technology and the data we collect can help educators and trainers actually develop better materials in a virtuous circle. So these four tools, empathy, escape, embodiment, and engagement, they give us a base to work from to design immersive experiences that have lasting impact. We can use them to tell stories. We can use them about the real world they're made up. We can use them to teach, to ease pain and suffering, to sell products, and build a deeper relationship with customers. And we can better relate to each other in the world around us. This is the most powerful medium we've ever devised to date. It could be used for good or ill, but in the balance, I'm hoping it's the former. I'm hoping that collectively we can help make the world a better place. As technologists, scientists, engineers, educators, designers, storytellers, and entertainers, we do what we do to have fun. We do what we do to make money. But we really do what we do to change the world, hopefully for the better. Thanks. Enjoy the show. Awesome, awesome. Uh, thanks, Tony, for that wonderful, wonderful start. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Um, so, okay. I was gonna begin dancing. I don't know, I'll get, I'll get down, I'll get down. Um, so like uh, Carl said, we normally are used to a small community, so I didn't really introduce myself too much. Um, Bruce Wooden, co-founder of SVVR and uh, co-founder of Altspace as well. Um, for those of you who are new, you're like, oh, okay, that's cool. For those of you that have uh, come back or this is your first day, or you know me, you're like, where did your dreadlocks go? Um, they're gone, they're in the museum, no. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of a, a cool change, and uh, we've got some, just the whole industry moving forward, and speaking of industry moving forward, uh, our next speaker is Ricard Cyber. He's very, very passionate about technology, very, very passionate about virtual reality. Uh, he is, let me get this correct, uh, the Senior VP of Virtual Reality at HTC. Uh, he manages uh, Viveport VR uh, and mentors the Vivex companies uh, and has experience with uh, video on demand, YouTube, MCNs, eSports. He has a storied history of uh, bringing technologies to the forefront and uh, making them successful. So we are so excited to have him here. So let's give a warm welcome to Ricard. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Give a big applause to the SVVR folks for putting on the show. Let's give them an applause. So when I grew up, I dreamt about being a superhero. And if I look at my two young girls today, they dream about having special powers. And for the first time ever with, uh, with VR, everyone can be a superhero. We can go anywhere we want, and we can be anyone we like. But today I want to talk about the real superheroes. I want to talk about the superheroes who have built this new ecosystem of VR. I want to talk about the developers, the startups, and the entrepreneurs who are making this happen. A year ago when we were here at uh, SVVR, the, everyone who was thinking about the Vive was thinking about the headset. But today, we're talking about a platform for VR. We're talking about an ecosystem. So I thought I'll give you a quick perspective how we're engaging with superheroes around these four pillars that we have. The technology, the marketplace, the studio, as well as our accelerator, Vivex. So if you think about hardware, actually, it's not just headset anymore. It's a platform of various accessories and various tools that can enhance the experience. And one of the things that we announced this week was the availability of the tracker, a universal tracker that you can put on anything. You can put it on your tennis racket, your dancing shoes, 
your fire hose if you're a fireman, uh, or your lightsaber if you're a wannabe Jedi Knight. The good thing with this is for developers, they can develop for only one thing, and it works for everything. And the good thing for consumers is that if you buy a tracker, you can use this for everything. So you don't have fragmentation in the ecosystem. But also, we have been amazed by what these superheroes have created. One of my absolute favorite experiences is the people who came up with the idea that they can put the tracker on the mobile phone. So the mobile phone is tracked in the 3D space. And then through the phone display, you can peek into virtual reality. And also, if you're in virtual reality, you can also see the person with the mobile phone. So this example is an alien shooter where you are the hero, uh, the superhero shooting uh, in VR. But your friends on their mobile phones can be your sidekicks, also helping fight the aliens. So there will be new kinds of uh, social multiplayer experiences, hybrids between full high-end VR and mobile VR. So of course, this is not just a tracker. We're seeing all kinds of awesome stuff. We're seeing things like wireless coming. This will be the year where high-end VR will be completely wireless. This will be the year where we have multi-sensory haptic feedback in bodysuits and other kinds of accessories. This is the year where social will really manifest itself in completely new ways. And we'll have technologies like eye tracking making the social connection to a completely new level. The best way to illustrate uh, what this is was a little video clip uh, showed by Upload that really shows the precision of the tracker in the 3D space, the power of wireless, and the future of gaming. So let's have a quick, quick look. So all of us, of course, in VR can also do this somersault, not in reality. Uh, but actually catching something in midair shows the precision of the tracker. And of course, if you are completely wireless, the experience is like no other. So this wireless uh, piece uh, was from one of our startups. So we have a program called VibeX. So VibeX is a $100 million startup fund. It's an accelerator in four cities around the world. And uh, we run programs every six months. And we just announced 33 new investments. So our previous batch last year was also uh, over 30 investments. So we actually have 60 VR investments. And what we're focusing on is superheroes who are creating things that can help the entire ecosystem. So the things that VR will need, maybe it is tracking, maybe it's social, maybe it's multiplayer, analytics, advertising technology. So we're looking for startup and ideas that we can help accelerate. So we put some money in, we help with technology, marketing, and help you take you to the next round. Then we also co-founded the VRBCA, which is the VR uh, Venture Capital Alliance, which has $14 billion uh, to help you take your ideas to the next level. So we really want to invest in these startup superheroes. So I'm the president of Viport, and, and Viport is uh, the marketplace. And I like to think of it as a place where you go to find all these great uh, VR experiences, regardless if it is for your uh, VR device at home or on your mobile phone, or if you're in a public space like a VR arcade, or you're in school, or you're in, in the workplace. So, but it's also a point of departure. It's where you start your journey into your next VR adventure. So we focus very much on developers. Our sole purpose is to recognize and reward and help developers build a business. And we're very proud because uh, we just passed 20,000 registered developer accounts on Viport, which is a milestone for us. But also, we just came out of GDC, and the GDC survey clearly said that Vibe is the platform that developers prefer the most currently. But it's also, the, even more so, the next platform that they're going to develop for. So we've seen a very positive response uh, from developers. This week, we also launched uh, in-app purchases. And we also launched the first VR advertising pilot in China. So we're looking for new ways for uh, developers who have free apps to start monetizing and making and building their business. We also announced that uh, we want to take the next step in terms of business models for VR. We all gone from uh, CD-ROMs and downloading our MP3 files to streaming music online. And of course, all of our video is probably also streaming music, streaming videos today. So we believe that the way VR experience will go is also towards a subscription. So we announced that we are going to launch the world's first 
uh, VR subscription service, and it's coming very, very, very soon. Very, 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 very soon. Uh, very, very soon. Uh, <laughs> and it's going to be uh, a very low price, $6.99 here in the US. You can pick five titles, and then on a monthly cadence, you can either keep them or change them. So I'm going to give you the first sneak peek ever on some of the key developers uh, that you will be able to, to, to play. So things like the Blue, Mars Odyssey, Apollo 11, Fantastic Contraption, Arcade Artist, and, and Firebird. And as you know, these are apps that cost you know, up to $20. And then for only $6.99, you'll be able to pick five of them uh, on a continuous basis. So we're looking forward uh, to very, very, very soon have you all try it out. The other thing we're super excited about uh, is arcades, because arcades is uh, a new way for everyone to actually experience VR. We can bring, you know, I can bring my mom, and she can go to the top of Mount Everest. So we launched Viveland, which is a sort of showcase VR experience, but we also launched Viport Arcade. And Viport Arcade, what we're trying to do is to provide a way for these uh, arcade operators to do a legal business. So most software today, if you download a game, for example, is for consumer use. So you and I could probably start a cinema with 10 DVDs, but it wouldn't be legal. So what we're doing is that we're providing operators around the world, and we're already signed up over 1,000 locations to be able to provide commercial-grade licenses. This will help developers actually monetize the opportunity to get their brands out there and not be subject to piracy. So we're running a global pilot now uh, in, uh, with 20 partners, uh, like IMAX here in LA or MK2 in, in France. And once we get their feedback, we're going to launch this on a, on a global scale so all of you could start a VR arcade. It has been very, very positively received by our developer superheroes. We have over 500 titles in our library, so I would say that we are the world's largest arcade platform today. So we're looking forward to grow this even further. So hopefully, we'll see you at an arcade very, very soon. Another thing, of course, mobile is increasingly going to be important for, for VR because we all have a mobile phone. And the cost of having a limited VR experience is, is going to be easy. So uh, in China, where we don't have the American uh, players uh, like Google being very strong there, we actually launched a, a mobile VR store, Viport M. So what we're trying to do is to help international developers come into China with their mobile VR apps and monetize there. We also announced this week at our developer conference in China that we signed deals with Chinese uh, mobile headset manufacturers uh, that will take us as Viport as the default app store uh, to around 10 million headsets by the end of this year. So it is growing really, really quickly in China. Then also we have Vive Studios, uh, which is our first and second party uh, development studio. And they're really trying to push what, and push what VR can be and do things that hasn't really been done before. So this week we're, we're launching uh, uh, virtual sports. We previously launched Arcade Saga and Knockout. And today, we're also launching a Make VR. So Make VR is super exciting because you can go into VR, you can create anything, and then you can instantly 3D print it. Uh, so it's a very, very uh, uh, ambitious project and a very interesting tool. So actually, you can go to our booth and, and try it out and print a little Vive logo. You can try Knockout and, and Fight. Uh, so please go there and check out these titles as well. And also, if you're a developer who needs funding, please come to Vive Studios and we might help you fund your project. But it's not all uh, about business. Uh, Spider-Man once said, with great power comes great responsibility, or someone. Uh, so what we did earlier this year at Davos, World Economic Forum, we partnered with UNVR to basically fund projects that could help save the world. And the way it works is that you have all these courses around poverty, education, climate change, who have great stories. And VR is a great way to tell that medium. But these courses, they don't have the development skills. So what we are doing is that we want to bring the courses together with the developers and offer funding to projects so that these uh, stories can be told in VR and we can change the world together. So yeah, thank you. That's So we, we got over 1,400 applications uh, from, from January, 
And uh, I, I engaged 120 people in, in, uh, in HTC to go through all these applications. And on Earth Day, which is September 22nd, we will uh, reveal the first ones that are sort of related to, to the planet. So stay tuned. But we're also going to open up this to our friends at Google and Oculus uh, and AMD and NVIDIA and everyone who wants to participate, because this is something we need to do together to make a change. Finally, it's all about superheroes. But there is one story that probably going to be the defining story for virtual reality. So Ready Player One. How many here have read Ready Player One? Wow. OK, that's very good. So the good news is that March 30th next year, Steven Spielberg is going to uh, premiere Ready Player One uh, together with Warner Brothers. And uh, we just announced that we are partnering with Warner Brothers and Steven Spielberg to basically bring this movie to market and also to create some great experiences for all of you to enjoy at events and online and on your VR headsets. So with that, I think that 2017 is going to be an epic year. Thank you very much. No, no, yes. <laughs> That's fine. No, I don't need this. <laughs> All right. Big thank you to Ricard and HTC as well. We're so thrilled. Uh, that they are here just going all in on VR on multiple fronts. That's awesome. And that Ready Player One stuff got me excited. If I can go to the Rush 2012 plant, that'd be so sick. Um, I'm ready to confront the priests. Some of you know what that means. All right, let's move right along. Next up uh, is a gentleman that has been coined as the voice of VR. He's been to, at this point, over 30 virtual reality conferences, done over 700 interviews. Um, he started the Portland Virtual Reality Meetup. Uh, not only that, he's also a developer. You can see his work in uh, various VR jams uh, that are going on. It is uh, just out of control. Uh, just love what this guy contributes to the community, the discussions that he brings up, and uh, sometimes asks the hard questions that other people won't. So it is a pleasure to uh, welcome Kent Bai to the stage. Uh, so my name is Kent Bai, and on May 19th, 2014, I got in front of the uh, Silicon Valley Virtual Reality Conference, and I announced to the world that I was going to start the Voices of VR podcast. And over the next day and a half, I did 45 interviews with a lot of the early pioneers of that first consumer gathering. Uh, since then, I've done over 700 interviews uh, with many different leaders in the virtual reality space, published about 520 of those so far. Um, and I've just been trying to organize all the different uh, things that people are actually doing in VR, uh, what's actually happening, and uh, just seeing how this medium of virtual reality is evolving. And one question that I ask everybody is, what is the ultimate potential of virtual reality? And as I hear all these different answers, I start to categorize them in my own mind in the, in the realm of the domains of human experience for virtual reality. And these kind of uh, describe different contexts under which you may use virtual reality, everything from entertainment to enterprise in your career, medicine, home, family, education. And so for me, uh, there's, what I see happening is that um, there's all these different silos in each of these different contexts, and that each of these different people that are focused on each of these areas have their own language for describing the same thing. So we have these silos, and that in some ways, virtuality is providing almost like this transfer learning language so that people can start to collaborate within the context of virtual reality. We're all working with uh, hacking the senses and be able to, to use the uh, human experience in order to collaborate with each other. So today, I just wanted to orient us in space and time to give you a little bit more historical context of virtual reality for how I see it, uh, for where it's been and where it's going, but also talk a little bit about the elemental theory of presence that I've been working on. So let's go way back 20,000 years to the first cave paintings, where you can imagine just sitting in a cave with some light, and you're completely immersed, and you see these images. You just imagine what kind of direct experience you would have that would be different than anything else you've ever experienced before. 
And then we go from there to hieroglyphics. So we start to see this evolution of visual communication that has a little bit more semantic structuring to it. But still, it's kind of atomized in a certain way. And it wasn't until we got the alphabet that we started to really go into this level of abstraction, not only with being able to have letters to be able to form words and thoughts that go beyond our direct experience, but uh, just to uh, use the level of, of language. And you might be able to learn about the world based upon something that you may have read. So we're moving from some, a world where you used to learn about the world by your direct experience to reading about things with language. And to me, I see this in, in the context of the left and right brain, the left brain being very linear, uh, the right brain being non, very nonlinear. It's almost like a CPU and GPU. Uh, but the left brain is very objective, it's quantitative, and the right brain is very subjective and qualitative. And so if we skip forward to 1454, that was when the Gutenberg Bible was first published. And we have like this kicking off of this revolution of printing. So books kind of represent this democratization of information. You're able to capture information and knowledge and widely, dis just widely distribute it in this uh, kind of mass production way for the first time. And so what started to happen is you have people like Ficino who started to go back to the ancient Greeks to translate a lot of Plato and Hermetic texts. And he was like, he started this uh, Plato Academy and was teaching a lot of these Renaissance painters about some of these old ancient thoughts. And this really inspired them to start to try to encompass the pure forms of, of beauty and truth into art. Uh, and then that same uh, thread of, of elegance inspired Copernicus to go from what was essentially this geocentric Ptolemaic system that was very confusing uh, to something that was much more elegant with the heliocentric model. So you have this switch from geocentric mindset to heliocentric mindset, which really spurred the enlightenment. And from that enlightenment, we also have this birth of the modern man. So we're starting to get into the left brain and science and objectification of the world. And the thing that happens is that we have this emphasis on the left brain. Uh, for the last 500 years, our culture has been driven by the left brain objective in the quantitative world. And there's been a diminishing of the image, the diminishing of the qualitative subjective realm. And so this is sort of a, encapsulated by Descartes. You have this mind-body dualism, this split, uh, where the mind and body are actually separate. You have your inner life, but you also have your outer life, your objective. And Rick Tarnas in The Passion of the Western Mind as well as in Cosmos and Psyche, he really says that this is a turning point in our history, that this is really like uh, the beginning of uh, what you could say is a 500-year journey of, of man and his hero's journey, that there's a separation, that separation being the split between the mind and body, and that we're kind of in the middle of this ordeal and initiation, and we're trying to resolve a lot of uh, issues in our world and our culture. So he sort of casts it as these dual myths, that both of these are happening at the same time. On the one end, you have like unending technological price, uh, progress, but on the other axis, you have this spiritual and ecological crisis, and these are both happening at the same time. So just to flesh that out, you could go from the printing press to the computer today, and you just see this exponential growth of like unending gro uh, innovation and change with technology. But yet, if we look at what's happening to our bodies, we're kind of like in this realm where we're becoming more dissociated and we're kind of like disconnected from our bodies. We don't have a good sense of what's happening in our internal subjective life. And we have this fundamental question is, is it actually making us happy? And not only that, we have this ecological crisis. So everything that we're doing in technology is kind of out of harmony with nature. A lot of the things that we're doing in this world right now are completely uh, not in harmony with, with the Earth, and it's just creating this ecological crisis. So on the one hand, we have this technological pro progress, but we have this spiritual and ecological uh, sort of crisis in the, at the same time. So this Descartes moment, you have this split between objectivity, subjectivity, the mind, body, and science and spirit. So let's skip ahead to the 19th century. We have the return of the image with the camera. 1890s, there's this amazing confluence of all sorts of different things, from film to camera to the transmission of power to the development of electromagnetic uh, waves, which then leads a couple decades later to broadcast radio as well as broadcast television. We have essentially, with electricity, the birth of this electronic age. And that drives then to computers. So then we're able to then have computers do all these calculations that we used to do by hand, and now they can take care of it. 
And in 1962, you have Ivan Sutherland, who decides that he wants to create a graphical user interface with a sketch pad, you know, and he just like starts to draw on a computer. And he's, in 1965, wrote this paper called The Ultimate Display, where he wants to treat the computer as a window into a mathematical wonderland, where he can just see the pure elegance of, of mathematical form. So that inspires him to build the very first virtual reality headset with a sort of Damocles in 1968. Then in 1969, we have some of the first transmissions of the internet. So we have the beginnings of interconnecting these computers to not only distribute information, but also to distribute images and videos instantaneously all over the world. So we're moving from this information age to the experiential age. And with that, we have computers. So I would say that a computer is kind of like the Gutenberg press of this era. It's democratizing experience in a way, just as the uh, Gutenberg press democratized access to information and knowledge. So we have virtual reality technologies that are able to basically hack our senses and to put us into these crazy worlds where we have these experiences that our mind doesn't necessarily make a differentiation between what's real and what's happening in these synthetic realities which then gives us a direct experience of like, what is reality? And so what I see is happening here is that it's actually moving us back towards this right subjective qualitative brain where we're, we're actually realizing how much of our reality is constructed within our minds and that there's actually a huge subjective component to it. It's not something that you're objectively seeing. So we have this shift back to the right side. So we have the principle of embodied cognition that essentially says that we don't just think with our mind, we actually think with our entire bodies. We don't really actually know how we're constructing the reality, but we have a sense that it has something to do with the holistic system of our body, our emotions, everything. And not only that, but our environment. And that's something like a unique, a unique affordance of virtual reality. So this is a graphic from Robin Hunnicke where uh, she showed at VRDC. At the very highest level, you have this abstraction. So that's the mind, and that's sort of the left brain. But at the very bottom, you have direct experience. That's sort of like virtual reality is able to mimic all these things to your senses. And there's so much of our perception that is happening below our conscious awareness. And so with virtual reality, we're able to give these rich direct experiences, which allows us to learn and have uh, retain information in, in such a, a deep and more intense way. So what I see personally is that with virtual reality, we're starting to have this convergence of objectivity, subjectivity, the mind and body and the science and spirit, whereas we have this Cartesian split that happened in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, but now this new Renaissance that is happening is this return to holistic thinking. So I would say that experiential design requires holistic thinking. If you're going to be creating virtual reality experiences, you have to think about all different dimensions of what makes a good experience. So just like Ficino went back to Plato to get inspiration, uh, I'm today also going back to Plato to look at some of these Neoplatonic ways of thinking, which is why I would say that looking at the elemental theory of presence um, is, is sort of uh, the thing that I've been really uh, focusing on a lot lately. So the air element being social and mental presence of being able to communicate with other people. Active presence, that's any time you're expressing your agency or will within an experience. Your, the virtual reality is actually putting your body into media for the first time. So you actually have uh, the sense that you have an embodied presence within virtual reality. And then emotional presence, I think, is probably the one thing that is probably the most overlooked in our culture overall. But there's a huge component for emotions and connecting and being really engaged within an experience. So if we take this, this framework and just apply it, um, you know, the ancients actually said that you know, all these four elements are happening all the time. You can't necessarily just isolate them. It's just maybe a center of gravity or so. So if we kind of think about that and say, what is the center of gravity of some of these existing mediums? We can look at gaming and say, it's a lot about you know, making choices with your mind and, and, and actually exerting your will into an experience. So it's a lot about agency and mental presence. Film, you know, it's actually encompassing everything, but it's also a passive experience where you're really receiving a story, and it's really ultimately engaging your emotions. And then virtual reality is putting your body into the experience for the first time. So I just wanted to uh, go through each of these a little bit just to see how I kind of see how these are playing out. Um, so with active presence, it's all about agency. Um, they're going to have gameplay mechanics, and there's going to be a lot more intuitive interactions. Whereas in a lot of games, there's a lot of abstractions uh, that you're pushing buttons, but now you have the ability to express your agency in an intuitive way. So there's going to be all sorts of new 3D user interfaces. 
Conversational interfaces, there's a lot of error element there as well, but the fact that you could make something happen in a VR experience by saying something is gonna be a new way of you expressing your agency. So think about that for mobile VR, what that means to be able to you know, not have your, your hands in the game, but if you're able to talk to a VR experience, you can actually do a lot more there. There's gonna be a lot of new creation tools, live performance, peripherals, I think, to, to kind of uh, exert your agency, the tools, essentially, and interactive learning. When you look at the uh, education, there's this you know, pedagogy of constructivism, which is meaning that you're actually engaged in the process of constructing your own meaning. So that's a lot of the fire element. So social and mental presence, you have the, the scene coherence that you actually believe everything that's actually happening. And I think the big thing with the social part is the uncanny valley. So making sure that your avatars actually feel real. Otherwise, it's going to break your sense of presence. And game developers often talk about mental friction in order to uh, have engagement. So the combination of natural language processing with artificial intelligence is going to allow you to actually speak and interact with these experiences. And that is going to deepen your sense of presence. So a lot of choices, um, a lot of the, the mind is about education, cognitive enhancement, uh, got some interviews coming up with people who are doing like consciousness hacking in different ways. So neuroscience, and also the brain-computer interfaces, this is what, uh, something that's actually coming up a lot lately. So you'll hear about Elon Musk and his neural lace and uh, doing more invasive brain control interfaces. I think this is actually gonna happen. Uh, kernel OS is gonna start with like, things with you know, addressing dementia and Alzheimer's, but eventually it's gonna get into the realm of cognitive enhancement. And I think over the next 50 years, we're gonna see a lot more invasive technologies. But the question I would have is that given this model of thinking holistically, can you really just hack into the brain, write neural code, and implant memories, or do you actually need the full body? Is it actually better to have in a VR experience where you're actually engaging your full body and your existing perceptual systems, or are we gonna have something that has these invasive brain control interfaces? I'm personally skeptical that they're gonna be able to, to figure that out, uh, but it's something worth considering. So in terms of embodied presence, you have the invoking of the virtual body ownership illusion. That means that whenever you're moving all of your limbs, you actually feel like your body is in VR. Because we don't have a really great IK, we're gonna get more and more of our body into the experience. And as soon as we have our feet and our hands in the experience, it's gonna take the level of presence to a new level. Looking at embodied cognition to see how that can change our sense of, of learning, it's gonna completely revolutionize how we think about education. Hand presence, our avatar, our haptics are just going to get, keep getting better and better. So all of our sensory perception has to do with the body. And I've even done some interviews with uh, David Eagleman talking about sensory replacement. So he's got these buzzers on his body that are taking audio. And for people who are deaf, they're able to actually mimic the signals that they would get from the ear. And you're able to turn your torso into an ear. So this idea that you could do sensory replacement uh, is an interesting idea. But again, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sort of skeptical about the limits of that. Biometric data, there's a lot of issues about privacy around data you're getting from your body. This is entering into a new realm. This is something I've been talking a lot in my podcast recently. Body language and a sense of place, these are all things that are gonna be communicating in a way uh, that are creating this sense of embodied presence. And finally, if we look at emotional presence, it's all about story and character and the colors that you use are creating this ambiance. Music is a huge part of engaging your emotions in a subconscious way. You have facial tracking and you know, empathy. And you know, I think there's actually a strong connection between our emotions and our memory. But also looking at like, uh, symbols and intuition and the soul and the collective unconscious, all these sort of more esoteric realms. Like, again, I, I think that emotional presence is a thing that we understand the least, but I think it's a huge part of creating an experience that's gonna be engaging. So this is sort of the framework that I've been using to, as I do interviews, I am sort of uh, parsing out and I go through experiences. I'm seeing these different levels of presence and I, that's how I conduct my interviews. It's also seeing where there's different blind spots. But um, I think overall, when you think about experiential design, this is a framework that you can use to start to develop uh, your VR experiences. So I'm continuing to do the Voices of VR podcast, and I'm also doing, you know, uh, I'm working on my book, The Ultimate Potential of Virtual Reality, which I hope is coming soon, and also the Voices of AI. So I'm going to be continuing to be unpacking a lot of these different issues and whatnot, and the people that are in this room are really going to be the ones that are going to be creating the future. And so hopefully I've been able to give you some tools to be able to help not only understand what you're creating, but also to create the most immersive experiences that you can. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, we can always count on Kent to do a thoughtful, deep dive on what we're doing with this medium. It's a joy to listen to. Uh, so definitely uh, recommend uh, Voices of VR podcast. Uh, next up to close us out uh, is a, a wonderful, wonderful speaker. Uh, she's been coined the godmother of VR by Engadget. Uh, she is the CEO and founder of the Emblematic Group, uh, which does immersive virtual uh, mixed and augmented reality experiences. Uh, that's kind of XR, I think, is the term that's in fashion now to cover AR, VR, MR, and everything else. Um, but uh, they've been doing great work there. She's an award-winning uh, filmmaker and journalist and just a, a great pioneer in this field, has been here since the beginning uh, of all this stuff going on. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Nani De La Pena. How's it going, guys? So, um, how many of you were here in 2014 when this thing, whole thing first started? A couple of you. So, um, I did something for that conference I'd never done in my life before, which is I heard about it, and I called Ken Krantz, the organizer, and was like, Carl Krantz, sorry. Um, uh, and I was like, hey man, you don't have any women speaking. You've got to include a woman. And, um, <laughs> I'd never done that before in my life. And Carl was like, man, we're already done. We're booked. I can't, I can't, I can't. And then I was like, I called up Palmer. I called up my friend at DreamWorks. And they all, I don't know if they called Carl, but and he's like, all right, all right, you can come be a moderator. And then I came. And I was the only female speaker in two days. And there was like three women in the audience. And I kept my brave face on the whole time. And I literally, when I got home, I, this gives you an idea what it's like. As soon as I walked in the door, I put my head on my table and I cried. It was so hard to be the only woman. Now Carl, to his credit, saw, heard, understood without my even telling him. And the next year he made SVVR free for women. And today, this time, he's got 28% women speakers. So big shout out to Carl, all right? So uh, just to give you an idea of my background, um, I, I actually won the CompuServe Award for the best use of their um, platform once doing research on the Chappaquiddick case. But um, I remember going to a bulletin board for the first time, and I typed in, hello, I'm here, and somebody said, could you come over here? I want to give you a hug. And I was like, ew, no, too shy. Like, I didn't want a hug from somebody I didn't know, but like, this was just text-based, right? Like, what is it about text-based worlds? Um, a rape in cyberspace was a really interesting study about this issue where uh, it was a text-based virtual world and, and some guy hacked in and he started text raping the women. And the women were incredibly upset. And there was all this research about, like, what does it mean to have this uh, sense of your virtual self, even in a text-based world? What, what, you know, how could you feel raped, right? So our virtual presence is super, super incredible. Not just text, now we get into the visual things. Um, how many are familiar with this Duke study that came out? A few of you, not very many. So this was a study where they were trying to help paraplegics by actually giving them these, you know, uh, 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 big, huge computerized machinery that they were kind of trying to use their brain-computer interface to drive the controls so they could maybe walk again with this robotic attachment. But what they found instead was that after a year of being in VR and imagining their bodies, all 12 people who stayed in the study, all 12 of them, regained use of their body. They had control of their, of their bodily functions, like going to the bathroom. Like they weren't running up and walking, but by visualizing themselves moving, they actually regenerated synapses. So take what, what everybody else has said and then you know, add this to it, it's pretty crazy. So um, just I'm going to go a little bit back, and some of you might know a little bit about me already on this. I'll do a short version of this, and then I'm going to get into some of our present stuff. But I got started doing uh, a piece at USC. I was working as a research fellow in the journalism school, and I wanted to do a VR piece to accompany this, this now kind of traditional journalism. It was a web piece, uh, which included photo, video, audio, et cetera, about hunger. And I, um, I asked the students if they wanted to... Um, uh, do a VR piece, and, and nobody was interested. Uh, you can see this published in March of 2010. So we went out, and we're recording audio. I, I, what happened was I found a, a friend who was teaching at UC Irvine. Her daughter had just finished high school, and she agreed to be my intern. And we were out recording audio at food banks until we recorded a day where this man waiting in this very long line 
who had diabetes uh, collapsed and went into a diabetic coma. Uh, he just didn't get food in time. And she came out to my office in tears, and I knew that that's what I wanted to try to make. And I had about 700 bucks, so um, we had to, I had to become a better coder, I had to beg, borrow favors. All my virtual humans were donated, right? Um, and this is uh, 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 kind of what it looked like. There's audio on this? Do we have audio? So all the audio is real, and we had to use motion capture instead of to re-record this. Okay, he's having a seizure. Okay. Some of you might recognize that. You can turn that down, volume down for me, please. So, um, uh, as you can see, we're in this crazy contraption in the lab at USC, and, and this guy, you know, he's not going to step on the body. He's going to walk around the body, right? Very, very careful. Some of you might recognize that's Alejandro Gonzalez Senior too. This was three years ago when I was first showing him the work, the director of like Birdman, whatever. So, but amazingly, he definitely was very careful. It didn't matter that he could see on either side and this crazy shit on his head. That got into uh, Sundance in, in January, uh, for January 2012. This is fall of 2011. Um, and the only headset really we had kicking around was called the Wide 5, and it was a $50,000 headset. And the head of the lab, Mark Bolas, was like, no, you cannot take that to Sundance. It's not leaving the lab. Um, but um, there was a bunch of people kicking around who were really brilliant, and we made goggles, um, including a kid who um, uh, you guys will know. Um, but we showed up with this um, crazy contraption, right? And... Um, uh, and opening night, uh, I didn't know how people would react. I call this my Gina video because this was a, a big deal for me. If there's audio, please. So what'd you think? Oh, you're crying. You're crying. Gina, you're crying. So you can hear the surprise in my voice. Um, but that happened over and over and over again, right? And um, again, to show you a quick look at that, the headset was actually made by Palmer Lucky. You can see his name underneath the tape. And then nine months later, he started Oculus Rift. At that point, he was crashing the hotel room and driving the truck back, and it was kind of an amazing occurrence. And then he sells it for, actually turns out, $3 billion, ends up on the cover of Time Magazine, gives us the most meme cover of Time Magazine. And I, I have to point something else out, though. This uh, was me in the, the April of 2012. The same group at USC who had been working on all this amazing stuff together had also made these fold-up cardboard viewers. And I'm, at, I'm actually at Google at that moment, and I'm handing out these viewers there for this journalism uh, event uh, on campus, at, uh, on the Google campus. Um, and then, of course, we get the cardboard, uh, Google Cardboard. We were open source, and the Google Cardboard comes out like uh, last fall, I guess it is now, right? Or is the fall before? I can't even remember anymore. Anyway, it's been an incredible ride, right? But I wanted to shout out to that team at USC for having really had these visionary ideas and letting me work there. Since then, I've done so many pieces, uh, one on Syrian refugees, on Border Patrol uh, violence, um, Trayvon Martin case. Um, we did a really great one on the, where you uh, networked, where you had to uh, drive the Formula One car uh, on up the track at Singapore, at the Singapore Grand Prix. Um, Kia was a domestic violence uh, piece about two sisters trying to rescue a third sister from uh, a fatal attack by an ex-boyfriend, all using real audio. Um, similarly, we used one, we made one um, called Across the Line, which uh, uh, was a partnership with Planned Parenthood, and you have to cross the line. So what do you do? How do you do that sort of thing? Well, we, were scan we started scanning people, and then uh, we, we used facial capture, and there's audio on this, please, to take real audio, everything you hear is real, and he has to mimic it. He has to mime it, and we put that animation on the characters. You're a whore! You're a whore! You're a whore. This is a shout You're at a young little women. whore. How about stop being a whore? You whore. Shame on you. Start closing your legs. Start having some respect for your body. Maybe your parents should have aborted you. So that's what you get shouted out when, when you try to cross, um, cross the line there. And there's been some very interesting research around that that's actually managed to bridge between like anti-abortion and abortion, uh, pro-abortion groups. Um, and I'm really kind of amazed at, at what's happened with that. Beautiful 360 video. We've definitely been working on that. This has been, we've been shooting in, in Greenland over climate change. Um, and, uh, but we're also making a volumetric version. So you'll be standing on the edge of these glaciers um, as well, right? And on that boat. Um, this piece, which is also 360 video, 
um, the New York Times uh, bought an Arte, and we put you in this cave in the, well, in various places in the Nuba Mountains, which is in Sudan, one of the longest running wars. Um, if maybe you get the New York Times daily, you might have noticed that they love this piece so much. They've been running huge, uh, full page ads to advertise this piece. So I'm really proud of the team that put this together. Um, been working very closely with another company called 8i for doing holograms. Uh, I was asked by a bipartisan committee to, uh, that's looking into the establishment of a women's history museum. And um, uh, they are wanted like a, something to go with their report, like a VR piece, but again, they had no budget. Um, but I found this woman, this amazing woman who was a newspaper editor, um, and she also was a printer. And when the first uh, um, Declaration of Independence, the, the, the official Declaration of Independence was printed, they asked her to do it. And at the very bottom of that screen, you maybe barely can see it, um, uh, the guys had all put their names on for the first time because it was treason, and she actually put her full name on the Declaration of Independence, which is pretty amazing. This woman actually signed it. She was pretty badass. Not only that, um, when she died, uh, this is her will, um, and she freed her slave and left her all her money. Extraordinary woman. So I didn't have any budget. What am I going to do to to recreate a print, uh, you know, a, a historical revolutionary era printing press? Well, kindly historic Deerfield has already got one, and we did photogrammetry of that space. These are some of the rough, uh, uh, uncleaned up, early stage of the model. So that's actually a revolutionary era printing press, and then we were able to um, uh, use holograms of the characters that I took her word, she was pretty fiery, and mostly made a script out of it, and cast two characters, and then dropped them into the photogrammetry using the hologramic data. Um, just to give you an idea of how that 8i volumetric shoot looks like. We shouldn't be out of time, because we're meant to finish her performance. We haven't done really? Yes. And what of Philadelphia? Well, your posting is keeping spirits up. Resistance. Yeah. As you can see, the cameras have to shoot from every single angle, and that's how you get your holograms, and then you can drop into, into, the, the, into the scene. So this also is not a video. This is actually a capture of somebody in a, in a Vive headset, um, and this is a, a photogrammetry scene of a solitary confinement cell in a prison in Maine. And um, we were granted access because we were partnered with Frontline and had already been working with this prison on a documentary. Um, so everything here you can walk around, right, and teleport through. So this is, again, um, how do we take real spaces and start to make, you know, journalistically huge steps forward. We were able to also bring um, this man who spent five and a half years in solitary in that cell and capture him again on the stage. Um, he had been released from prison in September. We did the shoot in October. Since then, he's been in and out of mental institutions because of uh, just losing it in the prison. Um, uh, and again, I point out how we have to you know, shoot from every angle. Um, My name is Kenneth Moore. I am 38 years old. A little trailer on this. I've spent 20 years in prison my integration back in society hasn't been easy. We did photographic of his bedroom as well. But I'm not. So we render these out into 360 after When I them. walked into my cell in the mid 90s, I didn't realize that. I would be spending five and a half years of my life in solitary confinement. I uh, remember walking into the cell and uh, all I could feel was hopelessness and despair immediately. I, uh, 18 years old, I was new to the system, never really been in trouble before. As an adult, Thrown in the cell, I felt alone. All the prison noises, the banging, the swearing, the cussing. So remember, when you're in that, that piece, you're able to walk around with him. You're in the cell, you're in a vibe. But we also, what we do is we do things like render it out in a 360 video now so that 
um, we're able to reach audiences like that, that, that frontline Facebook posting, uh, about almost two million people have seen that now. So, um, although we're, we will be releasing that uh, whole piece, uh, I believe in May on Steam, so if you want to download it and bring it into your Vives uh, or your Riffs. Um, this is one of our latest pieces we're working on, which is going to be uh, uh, also a DNA, um, sorry, also a frontline partnership, and it's on cross-contamination uh, in DNA. Uh, it's in a really amazing story about a Silicon Valley businessman who was murdered, and four people's uh, DNA turned up on scene, and uh, three of their DNA, the people, uh, their DNA was all over, and they were known associates, but one person's DNA ended up just under the fingernails of the uh, victim. And, uh, you know, that has to be conclusive, right? Well, they arrest this man who was a kind of known schizophrenic drunk. Um, he, um, ha, you know, uh, uh, ends up four months in jail before his defense attorney realizes that he was actually in the hospital at the time of the murder and couldn't have done it. So the whole thing becomes a um, investigation for the user to, like, you know, uh, collect the DNA, try to figure out the cross-contamination, and we're creating these really interesting evidence boards and using aerial photogrammetry so you have the map isn't flat. Um, so you can see how far it was where the drunk got picked up and where the hospital was and where the murder happened. Um, and this will uh, be a super interesting uh, project that we'll be releasing this summer. Um, how do we support our journalism? Like a lot of people, we do uh, branded work. Um, we did a really f uh, interesting piece with Cartier. Um, not only did we, um, uh, what we did is we took uh, historical photographs and we actually uh, rendered out um, uh, an exact uh, street of, of where the Cartier mansion was gonna be. And then in 1970, and then we did it again uh, for for the present day, and this was for a big campaign they had with the New York Times. There you get the idea. So in big budgets, you get to make pretty things. We also worked with Wall Street Journal in making um, their daydream app. Um, uh, I have to say, my team is really amazing. Um, there's 17 of us now, which I can't believe, but um, this allows you to take a live feed of the stock market and actually visualize the data in front of you laid out. Um, and what's interesting about this, and you can drive into sectors, et cetera, as you can see, we have a lot of situations where we're not putting the losers on the bottom. We're defying that old logic of up is good and down is bad because being able to see a winner and loser next to each other in a spatial way like this is super interesting and you get it really intuitively and we're now developing that into a much larger financial app which is which is um and i'm working with this brilliant guy who actually wrote software for nano trades for hedge funds so um expect a really interesting app to come out of uh, uh emblematic for this and this is when you can dive into the sectors right so do we do any fun things, right? A lot of hardcore news and stuff. Um, this was a piece I launched last week at Art Basel uh, in, in Hong Kong, and I took this, uh, it was an archive from an artist's archive, and um, this artist took that brick wall and he slowly walked it across the street, brick by brick, and um, unfortunately this is not the greatest uh, rendering of this. Oh, it's not on automatic play. Could you just click that video for me back there? So, um, uh, now you have to walk the bricks across the street without getting hit by cars, that's, right? No, that's totally fine. So um, it's, it's pretty fun. And uh, we add a little magic to it because uh, it's a lot of bricks to get across yeah. the street. But also um, the artist told me himself that he felt like uh, walls have life, which is why he did this, right? Anyway, it's kind of scary. Lots of screams trying not to get hit by a car. It's kind of a frogger. Um, the other thing we're doing is this really hysterical project uh, on uh, ro great rock and roll hotel room trashings. And we're recreating original rock and roll hotel room trashings, and then you get to trash. So that's emblematic, having a little bit of fun. Yeah, we've got this great Who song, we have the rights to, it's gonna be hilarious. But anyway, um, and then this, again, this, sorry it's not playing on click, if you could play this back there for me, please. Um, this is a funny Western uh, network shootout game. Um, you know, just a quick trigger one, and it's two people playing in the in the vibe. Um, uh, and I think the video will look up and you'll see, yeah, you see your hat and your shadow. That's Alex, who's always so badass. See, if you see up in the top, that's because your hat is up there. Uh, and there they are again. 
<laughs> playing, having some fun. I have to tell you, we have a lot of laughs. I'm going to finish up with a little story about being in uh, the Founders Forum, which is a kind of crazy organization that mostly people's companies have got worth billions of dollars or millions of dollars get invited to. And I bizarrely got invited uh, last year to have lunch with Prince William and this tiny little 14-person Knights of the Round Table lunch um, with like Eric Schmidt and Jimmy Wales. And uh, anyway, it was crazy, right? I was like, what am I doing there? And I didn't know what to do. And I asked the prince's ha like, handler, like before I came in, you, you were meant to, you know, stand up until he comes. But when he comes, I was like, where should I sit? And she pointed out a chair for me. And I would have been right across from Eric Schmidt and, uh, and the prince. And um, I panicked. And I ran to the other side of the table and sat by myself at the very end. I did not lean in, as it was. So just kind of like, kind of saying, like, you know, still learning, still learning how to be OK and be okay to be part of something like this. It's, it was very strange, I felt, for me to be there, but whatever. It was an interesting thing. He was actually starting a, a, a fund to try to help uh, uh, young people with mental health issues, and he wanted technology uh, uh, people to come in and help do something about it and provide things, and that's why I ended up being invited. But anyway, here's the thing to leave for all of you who are forming a company. That was an amazing lunch, yeah, but I think what I really got from that event more than anything was I heard this guy and he was saying, uh, you know, I'd acquired this company and I acquired that company and, and then, you know, uh, I would fire X amount of employees or like, you know, the, new, the CEO came up to me from one company and said, well, say, man, how are we going to work together? And he's like, huh, we're not working together. You're fired. My company by my culture. And I was like, whoa, that's really intense, right? And I thought, is that really how you have to lead a company? And then I thought, you know, my culture, my company. And if I want to be a leader in this and grow a company and be able to move forward in this, I decided I was going to lead my company with kindness and a culture of a family. And I have to tell you, you saw those guys having fun. And we're, we're pretty mixed. Actually, that just showed the dudes, but we're quite mixed um, in many ways and all gender and identity and etc. Um, and I work hard at that. But the culture in my company is that we treat each other like a family. We treat each other with respect. And yes, sometimes mom yells. But I take that and leave that for you, that if you're trying to get into this business and starting your own thing, you can set your own dream of what you want. So thank you very much. Right, all right, that wraps up the keynotes for SVVR 2017. Everyone feeling inspired? Yeah? Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so uh, with that, the expo floor actually is open. Uh, we have plenty of uh, demos from various verticals for you to enjoy and engage with. Uh, we are featuring an international section from Japan, Korea, um, and China. Uh, so we have folks that have flown over and showing off that stuff, so that's very interesting. Um, also, uh, if you go past Expo Hall, you'll see the breakout rooms where talks are happening. Uh, the first talks of the day are starting at 11.30, so in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes from now. Uh, and uh, we have uh, just, a, uh, just a host of dynamic speakers for you to enjoy there as well. And we'll have regular announcements in the Expo Hall to kind of remind you of what's coming up. Uh, and if you haven't already, you can get the SVVR 2017 app to keep abreast of what's going on here at SVVR 2017. Um, so with that, thank you all very much and enjoy the day. Pre appreciate it.